Welcome to Amusing Jews, where we celebrate Jewish contributors and contributions to American popular culture. I'm Jonathan Friedman. And I'm Joey Angelfield. Producer engineer Mike Tomrin is working somewhere behind the scenes. Amusing Jews is a project of Adat Chavarim, Congregation for Humanistic Judaism, the Kul Shul Jewish Cultural Community, and Atheist United Studios. Hey, Joey. The roots of comic book art stretch back to Paleolithic cave paintings, arguably the oldest form of storytelling. Ancient Egyptians circulated cartoons of animals on limestone flakes and papyrus. Renaissance painters like Michelangelo and Hieronymus Bosch incorporated stories into their work. Newspaper strips began in the late 19th century, and comic books proper began appearing in the 1930s. For most of this history, women have been underrepresented, sidelined, or marginalized, both as characters and as creators. Today's guest, a legendary comics creator and her historian, has done much to document and correct this problem. We're honored to chat with Trina Robbins, a pioneer underground cartoonist and comics historian who has been writing comics, graphic novels, and books for nearly half a century. She was the first woman artist to draw a Wonder Woman comic, created the teenage superheroine Go Girl, and has written numerous books on women in the comic book industry, including the illustrated biography Lily Renee, Escape Artist from Holocaust Survivor to Comic Book Pioneer. Her latest book is Dauntless Dames, High Heeled Heroes of the Comics. Trina, welcome to Amusing Jews. Hi. You were born in Brooklyn and then became involved in science fiction fandom in the 50s and by the early 70s were one of the few women contributors to the comics underground scene. Uh, how did one thing lead to another? Um, well, I always drew. I always drew. I mean, you know, before I could, could read, I drew. And as soon as I could read, I always wrote, read and, and wrote. I mean, they come together and they came together. I first discovered your work in high school when I found your book, The Great Women Superheroes at the San Diego Comic Con. I've reread that book several times over the years, including in advance of this interview. One of the points you make is that women superheroes, especially in the early years, were typically called girl, whereas male heroes were called man. There was Flame Girl, Hawk Girl, Golden Girl, Yankee Girl, and the like. I wonder if you noticed this disparity as a young reader and if it maybe amplified your attraction to Wonder Woman. Not really. My affection for her is because she's a beautiful Amazon who lives on an island where no men are allowed. And she's not really a superhero in the sense that she doesn't have superpowers, right? They've given her superpowers. They've given her the ability to fly, which is really silly because she didn't fly in the beginning. She could leap tall buildings in a single bound, which, of course, Superman could too. It was her Amazon training. If you have the right training, you can be a superheroine or a heroine. You know, you can be like Wonder Woman. Because all the Amazons on Paradise Island, you know, they were all strong and fabulous too. But, you know, no, she couldn't fly. And I'm really sorry that, that they decided she could fly. That's not my Wonder Woman. Have you followed the character much over the years? Oh, uh, periodically I'll pick a copy up and see what's going on. And um, it looks like not much is going on recently. I think I bought a Wonder Woman comic maybe a month ago, and it was it was nothing. You designed the costume for Vampirella, which debuted in Vampirella number no. 1 in September 1969. She's voluptuous and scantily clad, yet powerful and in control of her own destiny. And the magazine itself was called Captivating Comics About Fantastic Females. There's been some debate over the years about whether Vampirella is a feminist or sexist character, and whether it's okay to be a feminist and a fan of the character. Do you have any thoughts on this? Well, I'm feminist and I'm a fan of the character, although I haven't read her recently. I was a fan of the character when she was published by Jim Warren, and they did some great stories. Are you a fan of the Frazetta art as well? How could you not be a fan of Frazetta art? He was incredible. Yeah, and his women, I think, um, you know, also debates about whether they're submissive or powerful, maybe a combination of the two. Well, he just loved to draw women, and he did such a good job. I think that if you if you consider Frazetta's drawings of women sexist, then you might as well go all the way back, you know, to the, the 17th and 16th centuries and 
and look at the gorgeous nudes and say they're sexist, but they're not. In fact, you might as well go back to ancient Greece and look at the beautiful statues of, of, of you know, uh, the uh, the beautiful, you know, the goddesses, you know, and they're not sexist, they're beautiful. Yeah, so uh, kind of along the same lines, you played a major role in San Francisco's comics underground scene, starting out at the feminist underground newspaper, It Ain't Me, Babe, and then getting involved with the groundbreaking comics anthology Women's Comics. During that time, male underground cartoonists like Robert Crumb were making hideously misogynistic cartoons, which you've been quite outspoken in condemning. Crumb is admired by many as the greatest living cartoonist, in spite of the offensive subject matter of much of his work. Have your views on Robert Crumb maybe changed or oscillated over the years? He's an incredible artist. I never said he wasn't, you know. And the things he's doing, well, the last thing I saw was his adaptation of the Bible, you know, and they're gorgeously drawn. And he isn't doing the stuff to the, any any longer that he did in the, the 60s and, Earl, and 70s, you know. But that stuff still remains horrible. And it's really interesting, too, because when he did it, you know, back in the early 70s, I remember it was either in Newsweek or Time that they actually wrote about him. And they refer to his stuff as naughty. What? Naughty? I mean, he's he's drawing, drawing women, you know, raped and, and murdered and with their heads cut off and, you know, horrible stuff, and they're calling it naughty. But times have changed. And now when I read about his early stuff, I see that people are just as horrified as I was. But they weren't at the time. I think these are different times. The great Joni Mitchell mentions you in the song Ladies of the Canyon, released in 1870. Trina wears her wampum beads. She fills her drawing book with line. How did this come about? I visited, um, I was no longer living in uh, in L.A. I had lived in Laurel Canyon, but I wasn't living in L.A. anymore. Um, I was in New York in the Lower East Side. I had a boutique. But I discovered that nobody buys anything in February. discovered that because... The month be- the year before, I had not sold anything, you know, in the entire month of February. And I, I survived by um, remaking vintage fur coats, which was a real fad in those days to wear vintage furs. And people would bring them into me. I, I knew, knew one of the guys who had a warehouse that sold them. And he would send people to me who wanted to hear their furs altered, like removing the giant. Um, shoulder pads or, you know, shortening and whatever. So that's how I survived that month. So I decided the next year, which was 60, and you don't believe that I just, I just would leave the store. I would just, I, I let, had a friend staying in my, in my shop and another friend staying in my uh, apartment, which was right upstairs from the shop. And I just would go back to LA where I had been living, you know, before I came back to New York. And um, visited a lot of friends, stayed with friends in Laurel Canyon, um, hung out with David Crosby, who was my very close friend. And through David, of course, I met Joni. Trina wears her on palm beats. She fills her drawing book with light. I had no idea that she was putting me this song, but I went to a recording session that, you know, David was doing it, the recording. Um, and she said, I have a surprise for you, Trina. And then she she sang that song. And it was, you know, wow. I asked David, I said, can I hug her? He said, sure. So I ran into the room where she was recording me for a big hug. So you were the first woman to illustrate a Wonder Woman comic book drawing the 1986 four-issue limited series, The Legend of Wonder Woman, written by Kurt Busiek. I love the Golden Age style that you brought to the series. That's what I wanted to do. I mean, it's an homage to Harry G. Peter, who was the original artist. And, you know, I still consider him, you know, he is, he created, at least co-created Wonder Woman. You know, because um, um, William Moulton Washington wrote it. But visual, you know, he created the visual. 
And she, every, no matter what they have done to her in the comics through those years, they have always returned to the basic eagle and starry skirt. No matter how many variations they've done. Yeah, and I think your choice to do it that way just makes those books really stand out actually in the history of the character because it reminded people in the 80s and to this day kind of what was so appealing about Wonder Woman to begin with. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, so but I guess the question is, Wonder Woman debuted in 1941. So why did it take so long for a woman artist to be brought on to draw the character? Ask the editors, don't ask me. What happened during the war was the guys went off to fight. And, you know, comics were very incredibly popular during the war. They sold millions, millions of issues. So the companies, they just wanted an artist. So they hired women. And the women were great. And what they drew, that's really important. What they drew were these really beautiful, tough, competent women who had adventures and could hold their own and who didn't need to be rescued by a guy, you know? Do you notice a difference in terms of the art style between women and, and men who draw these superheroes? Women, you know, when they were drawing comics and when they draw comics, they pay attention to the clothes. Um, and, and it's great because, you know, in those comics, you can actually, it's like a fashion uh, book because you could actually see what women were wearing in those days. Men, when they drew women in, the, in those days, the same time in the 40s, they had this kind of basic red dress that they put women in, a little V-neck, kneeling red dress, and that was it. The comic book industry has become increasingly diverse over the past couple of decades, with historically marginalized and underrepresented characters becoming main characters in both superhero and reality-based stories that often present socially relevant topics. Many of these stories are geared towards female readers. As a comics historian, what do you make of the current state of comics? You know, it is wonderful. It is beyond my wildest dreams. I really, truly never dreamed it would be this many women drawing comics and this many styles. They've opened the field up to, to different styles of drawing. I mean, you know, through the 90s, through the 80s, you had to draw in a, you know, if you wanted to draw for, for DC, you had to draw on their style. If you wanted to draw from Marvel, you had to draw on their style. And women... We tend, we're not really particularly interested in drawing guys beating each other up, you know, and that was what they wanted. And now it's incredible. You know, there are so many different styles and you don't have to work for Marvel or DC. You can do graphic puzzles. You know, it just, it's just so open now. Your character, Go Girl, centers on Lindsay Goldman a Jewish teenager who's inherited her mother's flying powers. How important is incorporating Jewish themes and identity into your work? I mean, it's never stated. She's, it's like, I'm Jewish, you know, and I'm, I don't run around saying I'm Jewish, I'm Jewish. Why shouldn't she be Jewish, you know? Um, it was the thing that people used to say about Chris Claremont when he wrote his stories and created characters was that he always said, well, why not a woman? And I said, you know, why not a Jewish teenager? Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Uh, in terms of the importance of incorporating Jewish themes or elements, even in a subtle way in your work, is that something that you feel is, is important or is it more write what you know and that kind of thing? I wrote what I knew. You know, I was a Jewish teenage girl. Yeah. And um, have you heard from Jewish teenage girl fans about how they relate to the character? No, and... actually, no. <laughs> uh, I think we got we got such bad distribution. You know, this was we did this in the '90s. You know, when when comics could not have been worse for women, and the comic book stores didn't want to carry anything for girls. You know, so that they they either didn't carry Go Girl at all, or maybe they got two issues, and when those sold out, they went. You got rid of those, you know, but most people couldn't find it. I I feel now actually that I was I was guilty of something at the time that is kind of um what would I call it? 
black sidekickism. I gave her a friend, best friend who was black. And, you know, when I think about it now, it's like you're being patronizing. You know, oh, well, let's have a, let's have a black character. You know, but I do have to say for myself that I also gave her friend stories that, that her friend Hasina became a girl detective. You have a lot of fans in the comic book world, a lot of creators and scholars and readers who really appreciate all the work and contributions you've done for the industry and, you know, to further our understanding of women's roles in comics and so forth and so on. But I feel that your name isn't necessarily as widely known as it should be. Uh, I don't want you to be uh, too uh, prideful in your answer, but what what is your legacy do you think and are are you do you feel appreciated i guess is the question i feel appreciated by the people who appreciate me um my legacy i really do have a legacy and i'm very proud of it is that there was a time when nobody had ever heard of nell brinkley when nobody had ever heard of lily renee you know when no one had heard of all the women that i write about and now now they know who these women are and they know how fabulous these women were and that is because of me and i'm very proud of her so you're both the creator and a her historian of comic books do you find that you lean more in one way or the other do you find that your work in one area is more important or necessary than in the other well i love to write i love to write and i'm a good writer um that of course goes from my histories to my her stories too i think they're they're equal you know, I really don't have too many women left to write about. I've written about most of the early ones, uh, but I, I think I have one more book in me. Since I know our listeners will really want to know everything that you're working on currently and things that are upcoming, would you tell us a little bit about that? This is my latest uh, book. I edited it. It's called Walk Back Down. It's got over 30 contributors artists and writers. It's a pro-choice book, and uh, we're giving the profits to Planned Parenthood. And that's published by Last Gasp? Yes, Last Gasp, who has done, I mean, now it's Colin Turner, Ron Turner's son, but Ron, Ron was the father of women's comics. Ron published the very first all-woman comic book, It Ain't Me, Babe, which I edited. Uh, he published women's comics which was the second old woman book um and he's also a, you know he's he's a friend he's a friend and he's a wonderful person well trina thank you so much for joining us thank you for having me and to our audience now back to your regularly scheduled lives amusing jews is here to amuse you if you like being amused go ahead and click like and subscribe 